Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2401 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today is the 10th lesson in our segment of Theology Thursday. Utilizing excerpts from the book titled, I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible, written by Hebrew scholar and professor, the late Dr. Michael S. Heiser, we will invest a couple years going through the entire Bible, exploring short biblical lessons that you may have not received in your Bible classes or church. The Bible is a wonderful book. Its pages reveal an epic story of God's redemption of humankind and the long, bitter conflict against evil. Yet it is also a book that may seem strange to us. While God's Word was written for us, it wasn't written to us. And today's lesson is, Is there really a sin offering? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 asserts, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But Leviticus seems to tell a different story. Even casual reading of the book will notice that the Israelites who bring proper sacrifices shall be forgiven. Leviticus 4, 20, 26, 31, chapter 35, chapter 5, verse 10, 13, 16, and 18. So have we reached an impasse here? Rather than labeling this a contradiction, we might examine our own perception of the Old Testament sacrifices, specifically the sin offering. Sin offering is the translation of a Hebrew word, shatati, which has a basic meaning of to miss the mark or to fall short. In using traditional familiar rendering, many English Bible translations cause us to misunderstand this sacrifice. The label sin offering assumes that the goal of this sacrifice was for forgiveness for moral failure or violations, sins as we often think of them. Leviticus reveals that this is not the case. The sin offering was used in cases where people suffered from bodily discharge, Leviticus 15, at the dedication of a new altar, Leviticus 8, and when the Nazarite completes the vow of abstinence, Leviticus 12. The fundamental goal of the sin offering was ritual purification. It was designed to guard sacred space, territory sanctified by God's presence, from infection by impurity. By its very definition, every person or object falls short of a divine perfection and must be ritually marked or set apart as acceptable for holy ground. The sin offering, better rendered as purification offering, was therefore applied to people and inanimate objects to mark them as acceptable before God. These people and objects were not acceptable because they had done evil, but because they were imperfect. They fell short of the holy perfection that God's presence requires. This ritual reinforces the idea of complete otherness of God. Dependent on the individual status of the community, whether priest or commoner, the blood of the offering was either used outside or inside the sanctuary. The blood was brought inside the sanctuary when the sin offering was for the priest. This signified the priest's undeserved but now acceptable access to holy ground of the sanctuary area. On the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, the blood of the sin offering was brought before the mercy seat, that is the golden cover of the Ark of the Covenant, within the Holy of Holies. Not because the high priest had committed worse sins than anyone else, but because he needed closer access to the divine presence on that day. The sin offering was about purification for access to God. But what about forgiveness? But if the sin offering of the Old Testament didn't purge people for a moral guilt, what about the forgiven language? And what happened when people did evil? Well, the verb translated forgived or salak essentially means to be positively disposed toward. In the context of purification, God now approves a person or object entering into his presence. While the verb may be used elsewhere to address moral guilt, such as Psalm 25 verse 11, when it comes to the Levitical sacrifice itself, the point was not absolution, but acceptability for entering into God's presence. Intentional violations of the moral law of God fell into two broad categories and were dealt with accordingly. Those for which there was no remedy, resulting in capital punishment, and those which restitution was required. For the latter, the Old Testament law called for reparations to victims to restore the offender. In this context, the words of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 are right on target. The Old Testament sacrifices could not provide release from spiritual or moral guilt. They merely allowed people to participate in a temporary and ultimately inadequate system while teaching them about God's nature. 
Only Jesus' greater sacrifice could solve the real problem of our moral guilt before a holy God. And that's our lesson for today. I hope that you find these Bible studies so that they will not bore you. And if you found this podcast insightful, please subscribe and leave us a review. Then encourage your friends and family to join us and come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, and most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more Daily Wisdom.